Awesome. So today I'll be going over um, the a service section system overview. Uh, I'll be covering here the learning goals. Today we'll be talking about um, safety first, what's going on in the service section, what systems are in place for safety, and how the said systems interact with one another. Um, I'll be stopping periodically to take questions, but if something comes up, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I cannot see everyone's face or the chat, so just, just start speaking up and I'll try to answer your question. Um, sweet. So um, here are a list of acronyms and terms that you need to know. Um, the top half are ones that I say a lot, uh, or I guess like ones that you need to know, like very common, and the bottom ones are ones that we say particularly a lot during, when in referencing the service section. Um, so you have high voltage and tractor system. They are almost the same thing, but not quite. The tractor system we typically use to refer to as the, um, the basically the part of the high voltage system that is that is between the air, airs and the motor controller. And the high voltage is before airs, although they usually just mean the same thing, high voltage and TS. Um, the low voltage system, which we're familiar with, then you have the master switches, which are on the side of the car that um, we need to turn to turn the vehicle on and to um, enable the tractor system. Um, you have PPE, personal protective equipment. You may have heard that a lot in the news recently. Um, and then the rest of them are pertaining to individual boards or systems you find in the car um, that we that we that I'll be talking about later in the presentation. Cool. So um, first things first. Most of our design decisions are derived from the rules, which means that a lot of the stuff that you'll learn in this presentation are things that um, are systems that we developed because of the rules or derived directly from the rules. So what that means is you could also just learn the stuff by reading the rules if you wanted to, but that's not why you're here today. I'm not here to start preaching the rules, although I do highly, highly recommend reading them or, or being very familiar with the ones that are particularly pertinent to your section. Um, it's also interesting to just go through them and think about why the judges um, may have made certain things rules. Um, but yeah, it all comes down to safety. So safety is our number one priority, both on the team and in the competition. A lot of the things that we do are revolved around making sure that people can be as safe as possible, uh, all things considered, right? Um, we're building an electric vehicle, which means we're building a very high energy density pack, which is going to be inherently dangerous, but we do a lot of, we have a lot of safety precautions in place in order to uh, reduce the likelihood of anyone getting hurt. Um, so um, some people believe that their skin has a lot of resistance. I know I did uh, before drawing formula. So here's a short table of uh, percentiles of people who have been measured like the resistance from hand to hand. Um, which means that 50% of people at 25 volts have three kilo ohms across their hands or less than three kilo ohms across their hands. Um, and as you can see, these numbers are within the kilo ohms range and the resistance drops by an order of magnitude. Um, if you're wet, if you're like your hands are wet or if there's a cut on your skin um, or the combination of both. So let's do some quick math to see what kind of current would that involve if we were to for some weird reason, short the pack across our hands. So the pack voltage is 400 volts, right? 403 to be specific. Um, and then let's take this, this number of 220 volts at 95 percentile, right? So two, two kilo ohms, which is a pretty, pretty like moderate estimate. Um, then you're going to have 200 milliamps across your body, if that was the case. Um, or two amps if, it's, if you had a cut on your skin or if it was a rainy day and for whatever reason you're playing with the battery pack. Um, so what does that mean? Well, according to this chart that I found on Wikipedia, that means that if you had two amps or even two amps for any period of time, you'll likely get very, very hurt, which is what all the stuff on the right means. Um, and, but if you had 200 milliamps for a very brief amount of time, 10 milliseconds, you're, you're, you're will be fine, perceptible, but no muscle reaction, right? Um, but this is like the current flowing through your body or like three piece of your body. You need, I think I read online, with about 20 milliamps or less flowing through your heart to stop it. Um, which is why you see a lot of electricians working with a single hand, like just one hand, one hand behind their back and another doing the stuff because they want to make sure that they don't create a circuit across your hands or it, across any path that could possibly run through your heart. So um, 
electricity is dangerous and we do a lot of things to be safe. But what if I'm wearing proper HVPP, right? High voltage personal protective equipment. Um, this here is Alexander Hoppy. Um, he used to be on the team and we'll talk about some of the things that he's working on. If you look in the back, you see that we're currently working on Mark III's accumulator. This was sometime my second semester on the team. Um, He's wearing a face shield. So what the face shield does is it, in the case of there being any type of short like arcing or sparks or something, you're protecting your eyes and your face. Um, he's also wearing high voltage gloves, two layers to be very specific. The rubber ones you see on the inside, this yellow one, those are for the high voltage protection. And the leathery ones you see on side is so that those gloves, gloves don't get punctured. Um, so you wear two sets, one for high voltage and one to you know, protect the high voltage gloves. Uh, so that you don't create a uh, short across your body, right? Because that would be not good. And speaking of things that are not good, is coffee cup is a no bueno because we shouldn't have any dr drinks or food in the LPB. Um, so this is a, actually a great picture to be showing y'all, but I felt like it was good to show y'all the actual equipment that we use on the team. Um, these are things you can find in the tool chest in the LPB or the face shield, I believe is typically under the tables as you can see on the bottom right here. Um, but usually the people who are working on the, on the accumulator are using them and they alert everyone, anyone, anyone in the vicinity that they are, uh, working on things that are related to the high voltage system. So, but even if you do that, you can still get hurt. Here's a picture of, um, a fuse that has current beyond its interrupt rating flowing through it. Um, fusing is something that we can, I can, we can end up investing an entire the lecture on, but what you need to know is the interrupt rating is the highest amount of rating, um, that you probably never want to surpass because things like this will happen. Um, so let's take a look at the Mark III's accumulator, like service plugs. So I believe these were the MSDs maintenance service plugs that we, that basically we use to interface between one segment and another because battery packs are usually, I mean, our battery packs are consisted of multiple segments. Segments are just like, you know, like smaller pieces of the larger, the larger set. Uh, and we do that so we can make manufacturing go a lot easier and also so that we can make it interchangeable. Um, so if one segment for whatever reason dies or something like that, we can swap it out. Um, so here's a plug that you see on the right. You see that it has very large cable. It also has lots of insulation and that very large orange plug that makes it seem like it's very safe. Well, uh, Lucky and I were working in the LPB second semester, uh, my first year, and working in the battery pack on the accumulator when we shorted one MSD to another. Um, and you can see there, enough current flew, and that was a single segment. It was across a single segment. Enough current was flowing through that uh, conductor such that it literally vaporized. I've never thought that I would see that happen, but it literally vaporized in front of her eyes. Well, we didn't quite see it. There was a large pop and a lot of sparks and very, very bright light. So we both backed away very quickly. But coming back to it, um, we noticed that this happened, which is terrifying. And also one thing to note about the vaporization here is that this cable had stranded wires that is now solid copper. Um, if you don't think that's terrifying, you certainly should. And that was a single segment of the pack. This wasn't even the entire pack shoulder on itself. It was one segment. Now we designed the pack to be a, a we not always to pack such that these types of situations are very unlikely to happen, uh, which is one of the driving decisions behind putting the, these type of plugs on the lid itself so that you can never do this in front of you on your hands or something like that. Um, but you should definitely talk to the people who designed the pack, like the accumulator mechanical team to talk about those specifics. Um, so pop quiz. All right, everyone get ready for a poll on zoom. Why do we, why is it that we wear, HVPPE. Um, is it to feel cool? Is it because we don't want to die? Is it to make mundane tasks exponentially more difficult, like holding a pair of tweezers? Or is it for safety? And safety in this case includes the well-being of others, not just yourself. Cool. Um, take a second to look at that poll. I actually don't know if I can see what the results. Can we publish the results? How does that? Oh, there it is. Yes. All right. Oh, I am sharing my screen. Okay. I think you're fine, Corey. I don't think anyone can see. Uh, okay. Like people are seeing the voting on the poll. I don't think they can see the results. But I mean, we Sweet. can also. You can publish it. Do you want me to publish it? I can publish the results. Sorry. Go for it, please do. Okay. I'm gonna. Hey, go Corey. Ahead and 
Yes. What's an MSD? Uh, main, uh, manuals, I think I forget it's maintenance or manual safety disconnect. Um, but there are the things that we use to connect from one segment to another. So in this case, in Mark 3's case, we use these plugs. Um, and Mark 4 and Mark 5, they're actually embedded within the lid of the accumulators that, like I said, this doesn't happen. Um, I don't think they're embedded in the lid on Mark 5. Or the MSDs, uh, are they just on the, like, above each air? Um, the MSDs on Mark 5 are, they are, they do use the method connectors. It's so like the different style, so they don't wait the cell. To, well, anyway, this is like. Oh, cool. Anyway. Um, in between the segments, but yeah. They're sweet, among the segments. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Awesome. So now that I have your attention, um, why did y'all come to this presentation? Well, we came here to talk about the card. Um, so here's the Mark V system Wait, block Corey, diagram. Are you which tell audio... us the answer to the poll? Oh, the answer is safety. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't clear. <laughs> the answer to why we wear high voltage personal protective equipment is to not only protect yourself, but just protect people around you. Uh, you want to be as safe as possible. And that includes um, by wearing HV PPE, it, it not only protects you, but it tells other people around you that you're doing things that are dangerous, right? Which makes them aware of the potential hazards that your work present, um, which is why it's not the same as not wanting to die. That's an obvious one, but it's also to make sure that other people around you are aware of it. Um, great question. Sweet. Uh, I like Kermit, this is why it's here, but yeah, the system. Um, Adi last week briefly uh, spoke about the system in various ways, and today we're going to be talking about the service section in particular. So here you see the block diagram for the service section, which if you straight out long enough and looked at the rules, you would understand it, but that's not why you came here today. Um, so all of the systems in the service section have to do with one of the following. Either the shutdown circuit, which is the purple wire here, um, this block diagram doesn't quite capture the, the fact that it's just one wire that's looping to the entire vehicle. Um, and that's because it's difficult to present, right? Like we have another diagram that explicitly shows that. Um, and the shutdown circuit ends at the airs. They are the positive side that powers both airs, which means that we can't power them unless the shutdown circuit is closed, right? Um, which means that all safety systems are operating. Um, part of the pre-charge sequence, which has to do with charging up the capacitor, the, the internal capacitance of the motor controller at a safe rate. Um, the discharge sequence, which has to do with discharging those set of capacitors so that we don't discharge the capacitors through ourselves by, I don't know, unplugging the accumulator or something. Um, and then awareness of, awareness of danger and safety. Um, all of these systems, all of these are, are, are things that have to do with just about all of the systems on the vehicle, but I'll elaborate more of that further in the presentation. Um, sweet, so again, super brief overview on the shutdown circuit. Uh, this diagram shows you how it flows from the battery, the, or low voltage battery, through all of these safety checks, the e-stops, BSPD, um, the rest of it, all the way down to the airs in the bottom right here. Um, if anything goes wrong, it shuts down the vehicle immediately. It's kind of genius, implemented by the rules. They give us explicit instructions on how to implement it, uh, which I think is pretty neat. Um, and just to point out on the diagram, these are the airs here. Um, we have two of them to isolate the pack, such basically as like a safety redundancy, right? If you had one, that's great, because in order to complete a circuit, you need uh, two ends, right, to be, uh, to be holding onto in order to complete the circuit and have current to flow through your body or to like get through anything. So having one should be enough if it worked 100% of the time but it doesn't. So that's what we have two, one on each pole in order to have like as much safety as possible. If you want to, you can include as many as you wanted, but that at some point you get diminishing returns. Um, sweet, so let's look at the accumulator. This here is Mark V's accumulator. Um, you have all six segments, the green bars here, the VMSs. Um, here shows you a view from the top of the vehicle. And then right here is the service section. So the service section is where we hold all of our low voltage and uh, electronics that have to do with the high voltage system. Um, pretty sweet render. Um, now let's look at the service section layout. So from a 3D point of view, you see on the left here how it's going to be sitting in, as you can see right here in the previous slide, into it, it slides in and out. Um, the errors are on the left and the right. And on the right here, you see the layout of each individual board. So you have the battery management system, the air control board, the T-cell, 
This tiny one right here is the IMD latch, and this large board here is the IMD, uh, which I'll talk about later. Um, any questions about anything I've said so far? I've said quite a bit of information. I just wanted to check in. Um, I have a quick question. Um, are you going to be talking in more depth about the BMS, or is now a good time to ask a question about it? I'll be talking about each individual board later in the presentation, yes. Okay. Sounds good. I'll wait till then. Sweet. Any other questions? Going once. Going twice. <coughs> Sweet. Let's move on. Awesome. So the first thing we'll be talking about is the air control board. The air is to remind you stands for accumulator isolation relays. Um, the relays are down here on the bottom right. They're just basically mechanic, uh, electromechanical switches. So when we apply voltage and sufficient current across them, they open and close and connect to two conductors together. Um, a relay can be more complicated than that, but ours is the most simple variety. Um, so what is the responsibilities of the air control board? Well, it controls the pre-charge and it controls one air of the, of the set. It could control both, but one of them would just default to closing automatically whenever the shutdown circuit is closed. And just as a kind of reminder, the last note of the shutdown circuit is the TSMS, the track the system master switch. So that's the large red uh, key on the side of the vehicle that we turn. And once that closes, the, if all the safety systems say we're in the clear, then it automatically closes in this case, the bottom side air, so TS air minus, as you can see by the lines that go through and directly go to ground. Um, sweet, so it does that. It also ensures that the vehicle is in a safe state to be driven. Um, so what do you mean by that? It means that there's good, communi good communication happening with the rest of the vehicle, so the CAT network is, the CAT network is working. Um, it also controls, waits for, it, and verifies pre-charge. So the pre-charge sequence is, Sounds sim sounds straightforward and simple as like um, just char slowly charging of the capacitors, but the way we do that has a lot of areas where things can go wrong. So it makes sure that none of those things, none of the things that could go wrong happen, and then it makes sure that we're in a good place to drive. Um, it also li listens for can panics. So if any one of the boards, for whatever reason, throws up a panic that doesn't control a part of the shutdown circuit, the air control board will pick up on that and then immediately open the shutdown circuit or activate the shutdown circuit is another way of saying it. Thus, de-energizing the vehicle immediately. The air control can be thought of as the gatekeeper of the car, of the high voltage system. I mean, um, so to recap, the air control board has to do with the shutdown circuit, pre-charge sequence, discharge sequence, awareness of danger, and safety. So the air control board is aware of any other danger that's happening in the vehicle. It also makes us aware of any potential dangers happening as well. Um, what I mean by that is on the super weird uh, chance that the airs can somehow, because it is a mechanical switch, right? It's like two pieces of metal touching each other. Um, there is a chance that, that those could be welded together. Um, so it notifies us if that case ever were to happen so we can be as cautious as possible when working on the vehicle or when diagnosing the issue. Um, any questions about the air control board before we move on? Sweet. Next board. The Tractor System Active Light. So T cell for short. So the T cell itself is this, are these two. LED uh, lights right here. You, well, the green one is on currently in this photo. But what they're doing is they basically notify bystanders and team members of the status of the vehicle. So if the green light is on, that means that the low voltage system is turned on. And if it's blinking red, that means that the tractive system is considered energized. And it's considered energized when there's 60 volts across the poles. So that's what I'm referring to earlier when talking about like slowly charging up the capacitors. When it passes the 60 volt threshold, the red light immediately kicks in, notifies everyone, letting them know that the, the tractor system is energized and there's a potential that the motor controller can turn on and also move the car forward. Um, so that, that's exactly what the vehicle, uh, what those lights are doing. It also notifies us if we're, if for example, like we're, if we're washing the vehicle during a race, we can know what's happening, right? If it slows down, stops, and the green light turns on, we know that we de-energized for some reason, right? It also lets uh, medical professionals know uh, that the car is energized and they should be aware of it in case they were approaching it for some reason. Um, sweet. 
there's also the AIL, the Accumulator Indicator Light. Um, and that is a tiny version of that, basically, which turns on whenever the tractor system is energized. Um, and that's, for the most part, for the purposes of charging. We want to know if the accumulator is live, right? So that's on the side that lets people know if it's live when it's on the charging cart. Uh, they both come on if it's installed, but the one you usually pay attention to when it's installed in the vehicle is the very large one blinking very, very brightly, which is exactly what we have a hat on it. We can still see it, but is extremely bright and too much for our eyes, unfortunately, when we're working in the LPP late at night. Um, any questions about the T-cell? Oh, actually, sorry, one quick thing. So these, the, the T-cell covers the awareness of danger and safety because it allows people around it to, to be aware of the potential dangers the car could have, right? So like a large vehicle moving is a dangerous thing, right? Um, especially one that we may not be able to fully control, right? So the blinking red light notice, notifies people that this thing could possibly move forward because it doesn't have an engine. It doesn't have a large roar, which we'll be hearing if the car is ever on. It's an electric vehicle, it's very silent, right? So we need the T-cell to do that. And it's also for safety, for those reasons I mentioned before. Um, any questions on the T-cell? Um, how does the T-cell board uh, know when there's 60 volts if it operates at 12 or five volts? That is a great question. So this circuit here, um, as you can see on the right side is a low voltage side. It's not labeled, we should label it. And the left side is the high voltage side. So basically it has some circuitry that we, that we have on the left here that is powered by the tractor system that does things like compare the voltage with a known voltage, uh, in this case, five volts, um, in order to figure out whether or not it's above 60 volts. That's a great question. The two systems are isolated. Um, so this chip here actually isolates the two, and what it does is it is a photodiode and a transistor, uh, which turn on the lights whenever, it, whenever the high voltage is it necessary. That's a great question. Does that answer it? Uh, I, how does the, um, wait, how does the photodiode work? Um, it's inside the chip. There is a, um, there's an LED and a photodiode that are inside of it. So whenever current's flowing across the LED, it lights up inside the IC oh, and then the photodiode picks it up and the photodiode then allows current to flow through a transistor. That's um, pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty dope. It also means that they're like they're galvanically isolated, right? Like electrically, mm -hmm. they're, they're on different systems. Um, so you don't need to know, you don't need to have like a specific voltage on one side to turn on the other and like they don't affect each other quite the same way. Um, so yeah, that's we keep them separate. That's super called cool. an opto isolator, thanks. Jack. What is it called? Opto isolator. Awesome, thanks. Sweet. Any other questions about the T cell? Awesome. Next board, the insulation monitoring device latch, IMD latch for short. So. On the bottom left here, you can see a picture of the IMD. So we pr actually purchased this off the shelf. The, the, uh, the rules to actually require it. And it will make sense here in a second. So the responsibilities of the IMD are to ensure that the low voltage system is isolated from the high voltage system. Um, and the way it does that is basically measures the resistance between the two. And then if it's below some threshold, in this case, 201K, 201.5K to be exact, um, then it, on one, of the, on one of the pins here in this connector, it sets it to low, right? It sets it, letting us know that it's in an unsafe state, but we can't really do anything with that low pin. Like we can't just like magically look at it and be like, ah, yes, it's unsafe. So we have an IMD latch, this board on the top left here, which basically reads the input from that IMD and then lets the rest of the vehicle know what's actually happening. Um, so on the weird chance that like, for example, we had a wire that was floating in the service section, like a high voltage wire, and then it shorts to ground and then it, undo like it uh, gets shaken up again and like um, no longer touches the ground, then the IMD is going to let us know that like, oh, we're in a safe state, we're in a safe state, oh, there's a short, okay, never mind, we're back in a safe state. We don't, um, we don't care that it goes back in a safe state. All we care about is if it ever goes into an unsafe state. Like if there's ever a short between the two, even for a brief moment, which is why we have the IMD latch because it latches the output. If it ever goes low, um, there's no way to reset it until we uh, uh, power cycle the vehicle as a whole. Um, and this large relay here is a part of the shutdown circuit. So if we ever encounter an IMD fault, there's nothing we can do. Um, if the circuit's working correctly, there's nothing we can do to turn it off except for power cycling, which is something that you can't do during a race. 
So that's the type of fault that if it happened during a race, we're done for, which means we need to have all of our harnessing up to snuff and making sure that all of our systems are well isolated from each other. Um, this has to do with the shutdown circuit since it's directly a part of it. It um, is allowing us, it is allowing us to become more aware of any danger that the vehicle might present. Um, and it is again, related to safety. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? Um, one quick one. Uh, does the SR, there's like this, is it, does it use a set reset latch with NOR gates, sort of like the SPD? Uh, it actually, so it does use an SR latch and it does use NOR gates, but not in the same way. We use an IC, like just like a, like a chip, which goes here in the center, which actually does that for us. So it, it's, a, it's a longer story as to why we don't use the same chip for the BSPD. We could, but in this case, we just use the IC, uh, which basically does the same thing. Yeah. Sweet, thanks. Um, so you said that if like the IMD fails and like the IMD latch like uh, I guess makes the car stop, we have to power like I don't remember exactly what you said, but like what does that actually mean? Like, um, so it means we have to power cycle the vehicle, which means that we have to turn the vehicle entirely off and then back on again in order for the latch to like to reset um, is, is basically what that means. It means that we can't, we can't see an IMD fault, hit a button and then like be driving again, right? In case that fault ever does happen. It means that it, like we, the car is grounded essentially. Like it's sorry, grounded is the wrong word. It's, it's held stationary. Like it just can no longer move until we do something about it. Um, there's actually a light on the dashboard, two lights. One of them tells us I think there's a lot more now, but, but there's two mandatory lights. One of them which notifies us of an IMD fault. So if this ever does happen, we'll see a light come up on the, on the dashboard, which tells us to be extremely careful. Um, does that answer your question about power cycling? Yes, thank you. Cool. Yeah, it just means that someone has to physically walk up and do it. The driver can't do it. The driver can't even reach it. Um, rules required, they can't reach it, but also it's very difficult and when you're strapped in, you know, like handcuffed to the steering wheel. Um, yeah, great question. Any other ones? Um, next board, the battery management system, BMS for short. Uh, so the BMS is basically a glorified babysitter for the batteries, honestly. Um, its responsibility is to measure, and this is dictated by the rules, 100% of the volt, like of the cells and their voltage. So it needs to know what voltage they're at to make sure that, that they're in a safe uh, position to be used. Uh, what that means is that they're within some range. In this case, the data sheet tells us that the safe range to use the cells is 2.5 volts to 4.2 volts. So it, in some way, is measuring the voltage of all of the cells in the pack. It also needs to measure at least 33% of the temperature of the cells in the pack. Um, again, dictated by the rules, I don't know where that exactly that number comes from, but they wanna make sure that we at least have some heartbeat or like some tune in on the, of the temperature to make sure that not like overheating, for example, um, is usually the most common thing. If they're, if they're becoming too cold, that could also become an issue, but at the temperatures that we like operate as human beings or like they're comfortable driving a vehicle, we don't usually get there. Um, and it also must communicate with the boards and making all those measurements. So if you look at this board, um, there's some things going on, but you can probably guess that it's not measuring all 96 cells, right? So in fact, the battery management system is a larger system that I'll be talking about in a couple weeks to the accumulator team. Um, to discuss exactly how it does all of that, the communication between all the boards and, and so forth. But for now, all you need to know is the BMS core is the board that's in the service section, and that's the one that we interface with. It interfaces with the rest of the boards that are doing the measurements. Um, this one has to do with the shutdown circuit, awareness of danger, and safety, because it's letting us know if the cells are ever in a, in a, like, in a dangerous state to be used. If the lithium ion cells go below two and a half volts, bad things can happen. If they go above four 2.2 volts and we overcharge it, bad things can happen. And by bad things, I usually mean fire or explosions, usually how it works out. You can look up online on YouTube, actually, different failure modes for lithium ion cells, overheating versus over voltage versus under voltage. They're quite glorious. But those aren't things that we want to experience in the LPP or in our student design pack. Um, and to elaborate further what I mean about 96 cells, if you look at the specs provided to us by the Confluence, uh, Confluence page, uh, today's video has been brought to you by Confluence. Um, so the segments here will tell you, like the, the information here tells us that there are six segments 
each segment has a configuration of 16S, which means 16 cells like stacked up on each other, and then 9P, which means there's like nine cells next to each other in parallel for each series um, of cells. Um, and so we have 96 cells in total, equating to 403 volts uh, max voltage, and it needs to read all of those, but it's not that simple, right? So there are six segments that house all 96 cells, um, and 96 cells in series, right? Our pack has 96 times nine actually fat like cells in the entire pack. So there's six segments and each segment has two chips. Oh, let me move that. Um, the reason we have two chips is because the max number of cells a single chip can read is 12, but we actually have 16 in a single segment, which means that we had to make the decision to split off into two. Uh, and we use LD6811s, which I'll talk about in a couple weeks. Um, but it is, the, for, to give you an example, my mentor this summer who worked on batteries um, his entire career told me that he's made a LTC 6811 schematics, I think, at every job he's worked at. And which means that he's used the same like family of chips for quite a while now, um, which tells you about how often it's being used in industry and how common of us uh, of like a chip set it is. Um, and then what that equates to is 12 chips. 12 ICs all communicating to the BMS, which means that there are a lot of failure points in that entire communication line alone that could result in us losing communication with the cells or like with the, with the chips that are reading the cells, which means that we have to shut the vehicle down, which is why oftentimes whenever we have a BMS fault, it's usually having to do with the communication line. Um, any questions about anything I just said? Can you briefly talk about how the configuration number works? Briefly, uh, sorry, I missed what you said the first time. The like the sixteen. Uh, this number. Yeah. Yeah. So sixteen S nine P. That refers to the number of uh, cells that are in series and parallel, right? So you can imagine that with a sixteen S nine P, nine P tells you that there are nine cells in parallel, like right next to each other, and then you have uh, sixteen sets of those stacked up on top of each other, basically, uh, and that's just a single segment the configuration of the entire pack is 96S 9P. And that's because each of the segments we wire in series to one another. You don't have to do it that way, but that's how we do it. Um, the series gives you more voltage uh, and parallel gives you more current is typically how it works out. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's perfect, thanks. Sweet. Any other questions about the BMS? Wait, one question. So um, looking at the diagram, why are some of the cells, why are some of the batteries 3.5 and why are some of them 3.4? I'm not sure if you said this or not. Yeah, great question actually. So that has to do with the fact that um, cells, when they get manufactured, um, they, get, they have varying characteristics, right? They're not always the same. No matter how hard they try, they can't make them consistently the same thing every single time. Uh, and the thing that varies between a lot of them is their internal resistance. Right. Um, and again, batteries are something we can make another entire lecture on. But to sum it up quickly, um, the internal resistance dictates how fast they're going to charge or discharge, which means that if you have a pack of 96 times 9P cells um, in a pack, that you're likely to get variance in your cells, which uh, variance in internal resistance, which means that when you want to current through it, they're going to be having various different level levels of um, like voltage reading across them. Um, what usually drives that another factor is, uh, temperature. So as the temperature varies on it, like, like as the temperature of the environment of a cell varies or the, the, cell, the cell itself, then it actually has varying, um, internal resistance, which means that if you have a temperature gradient across your pack, they'll be discharging and charging unevenly. And you might be wondering like, well, is that a bad thing? Like, 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 is that really like, um, something that we should be concerned about? The answer is yes. So if going back to the requirements of the BMS, if any one of them drops below 2.5 volts, like just a single like set, right? Then like one of the 96 that we have here or uh, 96 sets that we have here, then we need to shut down the vehicle because that means that those cells could potentially be under like undercharged um, or like, yeah, undercharged or let's say the word, I forgot it. Um, to the point where they're unsafe to use, which means you need to stop running the vehicle, which is why you want them to be as consistent as possible. Um, so the, there are a couple ways you can do that. Um, the biggest way is to, uh, this is like, and this is like a lot of information, but the biggest way is to 
like buy a lot of cells, characterize them and then bin them. So like you, you, the curve you'll get whenever you characterize the cells is like, it's like a, like a distribution curve, right? Mm. Of varying levels of internal resistance. So what you wanna do is you wanna get the cells that are similar to internal resistance to one another and then make those into a battery pack. We can't do that because we can barely afford just one accumulator. Some teams can afford multiple accumulators and they probably do that uh, themselves. Um, big car companies do this whenever they're making battery packs for their vehicles. Does that make sense? I, I threw a lot of information at you, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, mostly. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, any other questions about the BMS? Sweet. Um, now onto the air mount boards. So the air mount boards um, don't have a processor attached to it either, um, unlike the air controller or the BMS, but they do a lot of important things for us. So they actually enable us to make harnessing a lot cleaner. Um, and the way we do that is by putting the circuits that relate to the tractive system closer to the tractive system, um, like where the airs are at. So the air mounts take care of the discharge relay and resistor, the pre-charge relay and resistor, and the low tractive system low current fuses for the IMV and the T cell. Um, it also hold, houses the body protection resistors for the TSMPs. So the TSMPs are the tractive system measurement points. That's how we can read the voltage of the tractive system bus when we're outside of the vehicle, right? So like before we start the car, or I mean, sorry, after we energize the vehicle, we read the voltage using the TSMPs and we're basically reading it across two 15 kilo ohm resistors. And the reason why we, why we call it body protection is because on the weird chance that you like shorted your fingers inside, of, you can't fit your fingers inside them, but like on the weird chance you did short it across yourself, you have 400 volts over 30 kilo ohms of current flowing through you, which isn't a lot. Um, it's minuscule compared to how much it would actually harm you, um, which is why we have them there. So they, this is a part of the shutdown circuit, the pre-charge sequence, the discharge sequence, and safety. Any questions about the air mount boards? Are those heat sinks? Yes, those are heat sinks for the pre-charge and the discharge resistors, yes. Because and you have 400 volts that's being energized through an RC circuit. The C is the capacitor and the motor controller and the R are these resistors over like three seconds. Sorry, uh, which part are heat sinks? Uh, these large, like goofy looking things. <laughs> and we buy those off the shelf? Like the ones that flare out, yeah. Yeah, we buy those off the shelf. We do not manufacture those. Um, and then what goes into the, yeah, go for it. The, what goes into the design or like, what, like, how did you choose these heat sinks based on, or like, are these just the ones that they told you to buy according to the rules? These are the ones they told us to buy, correct. No, 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 no. Like we, we found the resistor and the resistor said, it'll have this much, it can dissipate this much like wattage if you have the heat sinks, buy this heat sink. That's how it works. Yeah, gotcha. we don't make them or do any analysis there. I mean, we do do analysis on like which resistor to buy and like how much heat it's going to dissipate, but we don't make analysis on the heat sink itself. Cool, thanks. Most heat sinks, um for like a specific package type are like the same shape. So like this package, I don't remember what it is. It's like a TO247 or something. So all the heat sinks for this like class of resistors will look about the same. Um, and then Corey, you said that you would not get as hurt if you like touched things on this board. Um, I don't know if I missed this, but like why is that the case? Yeah, so it's not necessarily things on this board. Um, this board just houses the body protection resistors um, for the TSMPs and the TSMPs are the things that allow us to measure the voltage of the pack when we're like outside of the vehicle. So like when we're standing next to the vehicle and we have our multimeter, like we don't just connect it straight to the battery pack because if we shorted our fingers across those two measurement points, that means that we would have 400 volts across it with very little resistance. So instead we put these giant resistors basically, um, I, they're physically not that large, but they're large resistance. Uh, so that if you did short them, short your like hand across it or your body across it, you would have 30 kilo ohms or like a very large resistance of current flowing through your body. So it's not a lot. Um, it makes it into like a, a safe amount, I guess. That's a weird way of saying it, but yeah. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Sweet. Um, any other questions about these boards? They're pretty wonky shapes. I think that's my favorite part about them. Lots of connectors on them. Oh, this is a fuse, by the way. This is of our main pack fuse. Um, dope. 
at this point, you may have noticed something. You may be like, wait a minute, Corey. I, I think I noticed something funny about going on with all these slides. Yeah, they all have something to do with safety. All of the systems that are in the service section are designed and put there for the safety of the people who are going to be using those set systems. Um, which is why we put a lot of time and care into making sure they work correctly. And which is why we go through a lot of inspections at competition to just be able to drive. There's an accumulator inspection where they inspect the accumulator, the insides of it and the design. There is electrical technical inspection where we do all of these safety checks basically on the vehicle. And it's like a couple hour long process. There's a mechanical inspection and a couple others that uh, we have to do to make sure that the car is up to snuff and safe to be driven on the track around people. Um, so just a quick recap. Um, today we learned about the service section um, of which the block diagram is on the right. We learned about the air control board um, which controls the airs here, the little blocks you see here. It controls the airs, the pre-charge sequence, and it also makes sure that we're in a safe place to be driving the vehicle. We cover the T-cell slash AIL, the track the system active light, which controls the large, uh, the very bright red and green light on top of the vehicle to alert people of what the status of the vehicle is when they're around it. We talked about the IMD latch. So the IMD is the thing that's measuring the resistance between the high voltage system and the low voltage system and making sure that they're isolated from each other. And the latch, all it does is, is that if we ever go in a safe in a state where there is a short, it latches that state and let us, lets us know that there was even, for even a moment, a short between the two systems. And then we promptly shut down a vehicle. Um, learn about the battery management system, which is the glorified babysitter, which takes care of, or ensures that the cells are in a safe, in a safe state to be used by the vehicle. And we talked about the air mount boards, which have some very important circuitry, like the pre-charge, discharge, and also the body protection resistors for the measurement points. Any questions? Not a question, but this is a really great presentation. Thank you. In fact, you can leave that in the feedback form. Um, can you put that if you, in the chat? Yes. Absolutely. Right. Um, now is a great also, time to ask questions if you if there's anything in that presentation you don't think you fully understand. It's a lot of please do because stuff. If you don't understand it, there might be someone else who also doesn't understand it um, too. So please feel free to ask questions, even if it's like this back in like the safety stuff too. Um, I had a question, uh, not super high level or anything, but like for the T cell, is it like? The lights that go off, are those regulated by the rules just so it's like across the board the same? Um, that's a great question. And I don't think so. I think they, I forgot if they did, like they specify a bright, I don't think they even specify brightness. I think they just said there needs to be a bright, like vague bright LED under the hoop. Like it specifies the location, but not the exact like light itself. Um, so we actually get to purchase those. Some teams make them, we buy them off the shelf from, superbrightleds.com uh, because we need a super bright LED for this purpose. Um, but yeah, we just buy it basically and then we plug it into our vehicle control it. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. You can read the rules and control F for T-cell, but basically they specify a distance from the vehicle at which in a 360 degree radius at that distance, you have to be able to um, see it in a bright, like bright outdoor light or something like that. I forget exactly what it says. So you can, you can make it whatever you want as long as it satisfies that rule. Yeah, it's direct sunlight, I think. From every horizontal direction, except the ones black with the hoop. Oh, wow. See, like it's very, the rules get very. I don't on know the, how easy it is to read them. Either. On the, AIL board, um, is, it, is there any danger to having a high voltage system and a low voltage system short to the same ground? Or they're not, yeah, sorry. To answer your question, yes, because that means that they're electrically connected. They Whereas, are actually not, they're not shorted to the same ground because then it would be unsafe, yes. Right, um, that, that would be the IMD situation? 
Correct. The IMD would catch that if it ever was, but they're completely isolated aside from the photodiode and the, uh, so the opto isolator, which has a, like the only way they're communicating is via light, which is intrinsically right. disconnected from one another. Yeah. So on the left side of that board, there is nothing that's like via to ground. Um, well, ground is relative, right? It's relative, to, uh, like voltage is relative. So right. there is like tractor system ground and that's different than the low voltage ground. So like we do have- Oh, I see. Like a ground return path for the current to flow on the, on the high voltage path, but it's, 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 it's electrically different than the ground that we have on our low voltage system. Okay, yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And Jack, why can't, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Isabel. Oh, I was just gonna say like, why can't they be the same ground? Um, just because, like, wouldn't they just be relative to each other? Or are there, like, other problems with that? That's a good question. Um, so in some senses, it would be easier for them to have the same ground. And by some, I mean extremely few. So, like, this is one of the few circuits where that would actually help in any way. But by having the two grounds connected, and I'm, of course, Lucky, please elaborate on this further. Um, but, like, by having the two grounds connected, or rather, like, let me start, let me start earlier. So by having them, um, for a circuit to be complete, you need two points of contact, right? Like if you just hold on to the, like, uh, to like a 12 volt battery, the plus side, nothing's gonna happen because there's no circuit. But if you hold your hand onto the plus side of a 12 volt battery and your hands to the ground of a low volt battery and you're also wet and you also have a, then there, there could potentially be a circuit across your hands, right? Um, so we had the grounds the ground of the tractor system and the ground of the low voltage system shorted together, that means you've lost w one touch isolation, which means that now all you need is one hand um, on the chassis, which is our ground, and your, your hand on something else to complete that circuit. Um, if they're separate, then you would need two points of contact from the tractor system in order, and two points of contact from yourself for there to be any damage or circuit to be complete. The IMD catches a single point of contact. So it even prevents the instance of there being two by shutting the vehicle down when there's just one. Um, Lucky, would you like to add on to that? No, I think that was good. I just wanted to, um, what I was gonna say before is, um, Jack, when you asked the question, like, are there, is there nothing on the left side that's via to ground? So on this board, there's not a complete ground plane on the bottom layer, if you actually look at if you open up the KiCad file, which you should have access to mm -hmm. on the GitHub repo, you'll see that the ground plane is, I don't even know if there is a plane on the left, but on the right, it's probably split somewhere a little bit before the opto isolator or something like that. Or maybe it's all the way before the, uh, the separation lines um, that you can see in silk screen. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think that answers my question. That's I think what I was, what I was confused about. Cool. Isabel, did, did that answer your question, by the way? uh yeah for the most part yeah, i'm just like having a little bit of trouble visualizing like why that's still the case but um like pretty good for now yeah i mean your intuition well, yeah. is correct that there would be absolutely no immediate danger if you grounded ts like not if you ground if you connected ts minus to the glv system ground there would be no immediate danger to anybody but it's part of a redundancy to completely isolate both systems. Um, probably partially because it makes it easier to tell when they're connected at all in any way, but also um, to make it so you need more points of failure for someone to get hurt. So if they're on different grounds, like I know that we ground one system with a chassis, but like which system in the, is that? And like, what do we ground the other system to? Um, great question. We ground the low voltage system to the chassis, um, which means that we can like clip onto the chassis if we ever needed a ground, for example. Um, the high voltage system isn't grounded to anything because the only thing it ever powers or basically touches is the motor controller, aside from a couple measurement points and the IMD T cell for reference. Um, but aside from that, it doesn't really, the batteries don't really like drive current to anything except for making the motor move. Um, so there's like not really a need there. Is that, does okay. that answer? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Also, isn't it the case that the, like the return path just goes to the negative terminal of the battery of like the accumulator sort of? And for then- For what return path? For like the, like, 
because in theory you need to have like a positive terminal and a negative terminal and like for the ground for the glv system the neg like the negative terminal is connected it's like shorted to the chassis is that how it is that how grandum works and then yes. in for the tractive system it would be like it goes out through the positive to the accumulator and then the return path goes to the negative terminal of the accumulator do i have that right yes okay cool thanks for the yeah sanity. there's no interaction between between the two systems just to right. clarify yeah right so one thing i think that's a bit more of a it's not as much of a distinction as you're making it sound maybe Jack is like the fact that we ground the low voltage battery to the chassis has nothing to do with creating a different return path for like the energy leaving the LV batteries. Like the LV batteries operate the same way as the TS batteries do where you have a positive pole and you have a negative pole. And so all current leaves the positive pole and comes back to the negative pole. The reason we connect the chassis to the negative pole of the GLV batteries is so that every critical component that's bolted to the chassis that has both high voltage and low voltage or that's close enough to the high voltage system like the motor controller for example which has a metal enclosure when we bolt that to the chassis it's automatically shorted to the low side of the glv battery so that if there is a loss of isolation to that piece of metal it will be caught by the imd so the reason we ground the low voltage system to the chassis um, is specifically so that if you, so that every piece of metal that's anywhere near the high voltage system is going to be caught by um, the IMD if it gets shorted to any, any part of the tractor system. Cool, that, that makes a lot of sense, thanks. If you're curious about what that looks like, if you look at Mark IV and you see like all that copper tape all over it, or like random lock wire spanning between two random things for seemingly no purpose. It's to connect those grounds on all those pieces of metal. The rules have changed for grounding because previously it used to be for every piece of metal on the car has to be grounded, but now it's every piece of metal within some distance of the tractive system has to be grounded. Great questions, y'all. Uh, any other ones? before we wrap up. Going once, going twice. If you do have any questions that come up later, feel free to reach out to myself, Lucky, Yachty, or Manu, um, or like, I guess just anybody um, who'd be aware of the systems, but yeah. Um, I hope you all took something out of this today. Uh, I'll be talking about the BMS more in depth on the accumulator team meeting, I think in a, like a couple weeks, like two, two and a half, yeah, 15 days. So, um, we'll send an announcement for when that happens, but yeah. Uh, we might be, I think maybe we're doing another one of these next week. I'm not hundred percent sure, but if there's something you want to learn about, please let one of us know because that will bump it to the top of the list of things we teach. So literally any electrical topic, just let us know. And if we know about it, we'll teach you about it. All right. I got to run. See you later. Thanks everyone so much. This is interesting. Hey, Corey. Yeah. Thanks guys. Yeah. See y'all.